Thank you for your interest in our study of God's prophetic word. We begin tonight. This is the first study. Uh, we're going to look at two things, really. We'll divide the class up. Uh, first, definitions, and secondly, Amos. Now, I'm going to just preface those remarks by thinking back to when I entered college. I was think I was 18 at the time. Uh, I went to a college in my hometown of Springfield, Missouri, uh, Drury College. It is now Drury University. I enrolled in a class in Hebrew prophets. And my teacher for that class was uh, Dr. Ernst Jakob. And you might uh, tell from that, uh, uh, from his name, that he was a, a Jewish person. He was, in fact, uh, the rabbi of the synagogue in Springfield. His uh, wife was my German teacher. So they contributed much to my education. Dr. Jacob uh, talked about the fact his father was a great scholar, and I certainly consider Dr. Jacob a great scholar, so I imagine his father was even greater. Uh, it is also um, interesting and sad to point out that he was in the concentration camp in Germany during World War II. He was at Dachau. Um, he managed to be released, meet up with his wife, and eventually come to America and to my hometown. I mention all of that because I remember so much of his teaching, of his classes. I remember this particular class on Hebrew prophets, and I remember his comments on Amos. That's what I'm leading up to. Uh, but the class itself was designed to help us understand what prophecy is. Now, that's the purpose we're going to have tonight, to try to understand the, the broad view of prophecy. We think of prophecy in terms of predicting the future. That's a part of it, but that's not all of it. So uh, let's look at uh, the definitions, and then we'll use uh, Amos. And the, I will say at the outset that much of what you're going to hear tonight uh, comes from my memory of my class. All right, uh, let's start out by looking at Hebrews 1, because there the writer of Hebrews is going to be referring to the prophets and then to Christ in this way. Long ago, many times, many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days he's spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. The writer is trying to address a group of Jewish Christians who are thinking about defecting and returning to Judaism and point out that now Christ, God speaks through Christ, and that revelation is preferable to the prophets because of the fullness of it and the revelation of our salvation. But the, the point we need to notice here is that God has spoken. He spoke first to the prophets. He speaks now through his son. We're going to be concentrating on the prophets. Now, who is a prophet? A prophet is one who speaks on behalf of another. Coming from the word pro, on behalf of, and femi, meaning to speak. So anyone who speaks on behalf of another, represents another, is in fact his prophet. The Hebrew word for prophet is navi, N-A-B-I, usually sounding like navi. And uh, one who speaks God's word is the prophet of God. Now, what has been spoken through the prophets has not all been written. Much of it has been written. That which is written is written in scripture. And uh, all that God speaks, of course, is his word. But we have his word in scripture in what we call the Holy Bible. So scripture contains God's prophetic word. We believe and we are taught that uh, the scriptures are inspired by God, meaning that they contain what God wants them to contain and there is no error in them. So if we look at this broad view of prophecy as whatever God has spoken, we notice that there are many varieties, many ways that the message of God is conveyed. For instance, it is conveyed in commands, commands such as be holy. It is conveyed in terms of information. If we take the rest of that quote, uh, be holy from Leviticus, for I, the Lord, your God, am holy. That's information. I, the Lord, your God, am holy. Command, be holy. Warnings, the soul that sins shall die. That from Ezekiel. Predictions, as with Noah, I shall send a flood on the earth promises. I will be your God. You shall be my people. Promises usually relate to covenants. 
God gives these promises under a covenant. Those who believe God's promises do so by faith. Primarily, faith is trusting in God's promises. The writer of Hebrews, the same writer who wrote the words we looked at a moment ago from chapter 1, wrote in chapter 11 that faith is the assurance of things hoped for. Well, we hope for things because God has made promises. And when we believe those promises and trust them, that is true faith. So you see all these different varieties of God's prophetic word. All of them are prophecies of God. That's what I want us to see. All of them are prophecies of God. But we want to focus on what is perhaps most familiar to people when they think of prophecies. They think of predictions of things to come. So we're going to look at those from the standpoint of seeing how God's word is fulfilled, that his predictions always come true. Now, there are a variety of prophets in the Bible. All of these prophets claim to speak for God. Some of them do, some of them don't. Some, with some, it's simply a claim. Uh, for instance, there are, were schools of prophets. In, that's something I learned in my class about the schools of prophets. Uh, they uh, speak uh, in ecstasy, ecstatic prophets, uh, very much like uh, charismatic people do today in speaking in tongues. Uh, they would work themselves up. This is um, true not only of Judaism and in Christianity, but it's, it's found in Islam uh, with the twirling dervishes, Mivlana. Uh, the idea is to reach God through some ecstatic, mystical experience. Now, the schools of prophets have not contributed that much to our knowledge of God. For a while, Saul had joined himself to the schools of prophets, and we read about that in the, in the scriptures. Now, also, there were false prophets. They were frequently on the staff of kings. They were sycophants who simply told the kings what they wanted to hear. Uh, today, uh, it is spoken about uh, the individuals who, in, a, in a advisors to a certain political person, president, governor, whatever, uh, they need to speak truth to power, meaning the advisors of people in politics should speak the truth even when it's not what that person wants to hear. But uh, the sycophants, uh, the lackeys on the staff of whether they're political figures of today or whether they were on the staff of kings in biblical times, they spoke what they thought that the kings wanted them to say. Uh, they were things that made them feel good. And they liked that. <laughs> so uh, they were willing to lie and make up things just to make their employers happy. Also, there were non-literary prophets, Elijah and Elisha in the New Testament, Agabus. They didn't write anything. We know about them from the writings of the biblical historians, uh, such as in Second, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, and the Book of Acts in the New Testament. But they didn't actually write anything that we have preserved in Scripture. Now, the type of prophet we'll be concerned about in this class would be the literary prophets. That is, prophets who spoke for God, and in particular, we're looking at the prophecies that they gave that were predictive in nature, and that wrote down their prophecies. Now, let's look at these prophets. These are the literary prophets that you see on your screen here. They're arranged in chronological order. No literary prophet was operative prior to the division of the kingdom that took place in 931. The kingdom of Israel was divided after we have David and we have Solomon. And then uh, after Solomon's time, his son Rehoboam. And at that point, the there were 10 tribes that separated themselves from the house of David and formed uh, what is known as the nation of Israel or sometimes known as Ephraim from the leading tribe, or Samaria from their capital. Uh, these prophets in the north, after 931, the first of them being Amos in, nine, or in 760, and you can see from the red in this chart, these are the prophets who spoke in the north to Israel. Uh, and uh, the beginning of that is around the, the eighth, middle of the 8th century with Amos and with Isaiah and Hosea. And the ones listed in black will be the prophets who spoke after the northern kingdom was taken into captivity in 722, when Assyria took them into captivity. And we have the 10 
lost tribes of Israel. So uh, in the north, Amos, Isaiah, Hosea, Micah, and Jonah in the 8th century. In the south, Zephaniah, Jeremiah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Daniel in the 7th century. Then coming to Ezekiel, Haggai, and Zechariah in the 6th century, Malachi in the 5th century. Now, the last two, Obadiah and Jonah, are a little bit hard to pinpoint. Uh, Obadiah could have been as early as 345. Certainly, he prophesied before 300, as did Joel. And the reason we can say that of these two prophets, the date of which is a little bit hard to determine, is the fact that they are listed in the Septuagint Bible as prophets. And the Septuagint was done in the year 280. So that would mean that they would date back to around 300 before 300. Now, uh, we talked about true and false prophets. Here's an example of a pro false prophet. And this uh, comes to us from the book of 1 Kings, chapter 22. Jehoshaphat, who is the king of Judah, the southern kingdom, said to the king of Israel, who is Ahab, inquire first for the word of the Lord. That means they're thinking about a campaign against Syria. So first thing to do is to inquire of the prophets. Then the king of Israel, Ahab, gathered the prophets together, about 400 men, and said to them, shall I go up to battle against Ramoth Gilead, or shall I refrain? 400 prophets, and they all agreed, and they said, go up, for the Lord will give it into the hand of the king. They were sycophants. They were lackeys. They spoke to the king what they thought the king would just really like to hear. Yeah, you go and you'll be successful. But Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, was a little bit leery about that. And so he said, is there not here another prophet of the Lord of whom we may inquire? And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, well, there is yet one man by whom we may inquire of the Lord, Micaiah, the son of Imla. But I hate him, for he never prophesies good concerning me, but evil. Uh, you see, the wicked king Ahab wanted the prophets to prophesy good, and Micaiah would not do it. He spoke truth to power, and thus the king hated him. Now, there's a test for prophets. It's a very simple test. If the prophet says something, predicts something, and it comes to pass, that's the truth. If it doesn't, it's not true. Jeremiah 28, 9, as for the prophet who prophesies peace, obviously in a context where peace is not to be had, when the word of that prophet comes to pass, then it will be known that the Lord has truly sent the prophet. Uh, that is, if God has willed peace, yes, of course, he should prophesy peace, but if he has not willed peace, which is so often the case, uh, that it will not come true. An example of a false prophet in 1 Kings 13, uh, as I also am a prophet as you are, this is a, a prophet speaking up to another prophet, an angel spoke to me by the word of the Lord saying, bring him back with you into your house that he may eat bread and drink water. But he lied to him and this prophet believed, he went back in with him, ate bread in his house, drank water and was killed. False prophecy. So in this class, we're going to look at predictive prophecy. These prophets that we'll cite will be, of course, true prophets uh, who were sent by the Lord and are speaking the word of the Lord. The context is always essential when we try to understand prophecy. What's going on? Who's it written to? What's the occasion? What's it all about? What is the context? Now, within a given context, as I learned from Dr. Jacob, Dr. Jacob, uh, the context might be different, but the prophecy apply in both cases. And that's why sometimes we can take a prophecy that David wrote that has a reference to the Messiah coming in many years later after David's time, and yet it applies to David and it applies later as well. Different context, but the same prophecy is applicable in both contexts. That means there are levels of fulfillment possible. Dr. Jacob even pointed out, as we studied the book of Isaiah, that there were, in some cases, three levels of prophecy, three contexts. Now, the thing that is invalid in understanding predictive prophecy is to begin with a presupposition, that is, to make up your mind 
what is the situation, and then you search for some type of justification or validation, confirmation. And of course, that is not a good way to go. That's not valid at all. I confess to having done that in years past in terms with sermons. I had an idea I wanted to get across, and so I just looked for some scripture to support it. And the honest way to do it is to take the scripture and to say what it teaches and not try to say what you want it to teach. Now, in terms of predictive prophecy, there are both curses and blessings, or woes and wheels, and these curses and blessings will be fulfilled, and some of our study will involve looking at that. Now, in confirming it, of course, the main confirmation of a predictive prophecy is that it comes to pass, and we can determine whether it's come to pass or not by external sources, evidence, or we call it apologetics, for instance, archaeology. The science of archaeology began in the 18th century, and it has continued and progressed. Uh, it is amazing what archaeology has uncovered and continues to do so, literally uncovered. Uh, the progress even within my lifetime that I have seen in visiting places like Rome, each time I go, there's something else that has been discovered. So archaeology is very important in validating a biblical statement. And we'll say this. Sometimes archaeology has no effect whatsoever. Archaeologists find nothing that uh, says anything one way or another about the biblical event that you're interested in. So it's just there. Now, some things that archaeologists have discovered have illuminated the biblical text. That is, they have thrown light on it. They have helped us to understand more about what's going on. In other words, the context. They've confirmed the very context of it. And in the in the process of confirming the context, they are illuminating the text. Now, some of the discoveries of archaeologists have not only illuminated, they have in fact confirmed the text. We'll see some of that in our study. And what is true of apologetics is also true of science and history. I'm not a scientist, but I am aware that many discoveries in science, and of course with science there's always a thesis, possibility is always open of learning something else and revising your understanding. But that science itself has in many cases confirmed or illuminated the text. I am in the field of history and I know that history, historians who like scientists consider that history is never a finished thing, it's always an ongoing project that is always subject to revision. But as far as history is concerned uh, and places where, and ideas and events that historians will agree uh, with themselves that this is very likely what happened, history has also in cases illuminated or confirmed the text. To my, best of my knowledge, true science has never disproved a biblical teaching and true history, or that is history that has been agreed upon as being true, has not disproved any uh, biblical statement. Now, just briefly, I'll mention, and all of you know this, the first prophecy was Genesis 3.14, the Lord said to the serpent after the, after the fall, because you've done these things, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field, and on your belly you shall go, dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I'll put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, you shall bruise his heel. And we know that's an ongoing fulfillment of that prophecy. Now, the prophecy to the, to the woman and the man, a part of that first prophecy, Genesis 3.16, to the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain, you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. And to the man... And the Hebrew word Adam means man. To Adam, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. Uh, thorns and thistles are symbols of the, the curse upon man for his sin and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread 
till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for your dust, and to dust you shall return. And of course, the prophecy of the flood, Genesis 6, 17, Behold, I will bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall die. There is considerable scientific and historical evidence, and to some extent, uh, archaeological evidence as well, that there was a worldwide flood in the past. Now let's come to our second part of our study tonight, and that is understanding prophecy from the book of Amos, the first of the literary prophets. Good examples of the use of woe and wheel. That is, woe being a curse, wheel being a blessing. And what is really interesting about this book, it ends with wheel. Also important about Amos is the fact that other nations are included, not just Israel which of course shows the fact that God is sovereign over all nations and uh, he brings rulers to power and takes them down as he sees fit. So God is concerned about the conduct and the behavior of nations other than Israel, other than his covenant people. And we'll notice as we go through the prophecy of Amos, as well as other prophets, that there is great emphasis upon what we call social justice. That is, on how man treats his fellow man. And also, there is a concern about being disobedient to God. And yes, even those outside of God's covenant, we would say in the uh, Gentile world, were expected to be obedient to God in, to a certain degree, as they saw God revealed in nature. And uh, then, and certainly that's true of, the, of Israel, Failure to be grateful to God for his blessings and, and assuming the position that man is in control of all things. Also not remembering his works and giving him glory. No respect for, this is interesting, the convictions of people. When people are despised and their convictions are negated and not respected, God is displeased. Then, of course, there is the sovereignty of God, whether it's accepted or refused. Or there is the fact that uh, there are signs and people are to get the message from the signs, refusing to get that message from what God does. And finally, refusing to return to God and refusing to seek God. should mention also that Amos is quoted many times in the New Testament. We'll notice some of those quotes today. Now, as we go through the slides... I have a color-coded situation and uh, also a situation where some of the type is in bold and some isn't and underlined and not, and not. So if you see bold type in black, that's going to be the sins which God condemned. We'll look at those. I, I want to emphasize those so you can understand what God found fault with, what he was disturbed about. In bold type in red represents the retributive actions of God, the punishments that God brings upon people, the curses for their disobedience. And then there are underlined sections. These are a variety of points that I consider to be significant that we need to stop and look at, uh, particularly ones that deal with God's sovereignty, uh, with messages of weal, a blessing in the midst of all of the curses that we'll uh, confront. And interesting also, sometimes Amos could be very sarcastic in his comments. We'll notice some of those and other points of interest. So when it's underlined, it could be a number of different things that are uh, interesting and important. Now, once again, I want to point out that there are prevalent sins that God condemns. Inhumane treatment of your fellow man. Unjust treatment of people. We call those social sins. Failure to obey God's law. Theological sins. Improper conduct, which could be moral sins, and hypocrisy, professing righteousness as a cover-up for unrighteousness, complacency, extravagant living, while one ignored the poor and suffering, was indifferent to their situation. We'll notice those as we go through it. That being said, let's turn to uh, Amos, not, of course, having time to read all of it. I will point out that this is the first time we will see, and we'll see it several times, the expression for three transgressions and for four. 
In this case, it's Sirius, Damascus, he's speaking to. And now three and four add up to seven. That is the number of completeness. Three is the number that represents divinity or trinity. Four represents the earth, the four seasons, the four directions. Uh, and uh, so three times four as well, that's 12. That's a, a number of completeness. So when you see three and four, the idea is it's serious enough that I'm going to take some action from God's point of view. So for three transgressions of Damascus and for four, I will not revoke their punishment because they have threshed Gilead with threshing sledges of iron. We get the point here that Gilead has been mistreated excessively so and uh, been treated with contempt and cruelty. And so God says, I'm not going to revoke the punishment. There's going to be punishment. And he goes and discusses that in the red, which we'll not read, uh, but it is retributive. As the first chapter continues, so continues the three transgressions and four. But this time it's Geza, which is in the news today. For three transgressions and for four, I will not revoke the punishment because they carried into exile a whole people to deliver them up to Eden, or to Edom rather. So once again, it is inhumane treatment of your fellow man. And so he's going to send a fire on Geza and cut off the inhabitants from Ashdod and so forth. Coming down to verse 9, this is three transgressions of Tyre and for four. I will not revoke their punishment because they delivered up a whole people to Edom and did not remember, interesting, the covenant of brotherhood that God expected these people who are not Israelites, people of Tyre and Sidon, uh, Phoenician cities, he expected them to remember a covenant of brotherhood that they would discern just from nature. So he's going to send a fire upon them. And then in verse 11, for three transgressions of Edom and four, I will not revoke their punishment because he, meaning the people of Edom, pursued his brother with the sword and cast off all pity and his anger tore perpetually and he kept his wrath forever. So he's going to send a fire there. And then in verse 13, for three transgressions of the Ammonites, and we'll look at Ammonites specifically in our study, and for four, I will not revoke their punishment because they have, and look at this, this is a moral sin, they have ripped open pregnant women in Gilead that they might enlarge their border. And uh, so he continues in the second chapter, for three transgressions of Moab, and for four, I'll not revoke the punishment, because he burned to lime the bones of the king of Eden. This is a disrespect for the dead, which God did not tolerate, burning the bones out of contempt for the king of Edom. And so he's going to send a punishment. And then he turns to Judah, for three transgressions of Judah, and for four, I will not revoke the punishment because they have rejected the law of the Lord and have not kept his statutes, but their lies have led them astray, those after which their fathers walk. So with Judah, he now comes to a doctrinal theological matter. You have rejected the law of the Lord. And then he turns to Israel for three transgressions of Israel. And for four, I will not revoke the punishment because they sell the righteous for silver. And here we get, go into the category of social sins again. And the needy they sell for a pair of sandals. Those who trample the head of the poor into the dust of the earth and turn aside the way of the afflicted. A man and his father go into the same girl. Here's a moral sin. So that my holy name is profane. They lay themselves down beside every altar on garments taken in pledge. And in the house of their God, they drink the wine of those who have been fined. In this case, they are showing their hypocrisy and their contempt for that which is holy. They have a number of things that God is going to hold them accountable for. And continuing speaking to Israel, uh, he mentions, and you'll see this in the bold type, you made the Nazarites drink wine. Nazarites were people who took a vow that they would never drink anything from the fruit of the vine. So they had made them to violate their consciences. And in this case, God was offended by this and telling them that they were not to prophesy, which was a part of their responsibility. And so punishment comes. 
And let's read a little from chapter three now. Hear this word that the Lord has spoken against you, O people of Israel. Still talking to Israel now. Against the whole family that I brought up out of the land of Egypt. You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. The two walk together unless they have agreed. Coming down to the next underlined portion, does disaster come to a city unless the Lord has done it? For the Lord God does nothing without revealing his, his secret to his servants, the prophets. The Lord has spoken, who can but prophesy. And then he will repeat over and over again the refrain, you have not returned to God. He continues to talk to Israelites, I think here probably to the women because he calls them cows. Another bit of sarcasm. Hear this word, you cows of Basham on the mountain of Samaria, who oppress the poor, who crush the needy, who say to your husbands, bring that we may drink. You can see what they're doing, this social sin, and they're aggravating it by excessive drinking. Uh, in verse four, come to Bethel and transgress. And here, sarcasm again. Uh, come to the place that you would say you're worshiping God, and what you're going to do is transgress to Gilgal and multiply transgression. Bring your sacrifices every morning, your tithes every three days. Offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving of that which is leavened, and proclaim free will offerings. Publish them, for so you love to do, O people of Israel, declares the Lord God. You love to do things that you proclaim are right pleasing to God when in fact they are just covering up your sin and their hypocrisy. And so he says, as a result, you did not return to me. And he will continue that refrain in verse seven, when he talks about other things that he did to try to get their attention. And you did not return to me, he said. And he continues to punish them and says, yet you did not return to me. And still, yet you did not return to me. And again, yet you did not return to me. After all of that, I did these things to get your attention. They were signs to point out to you my displeasure, and yet you did not return to me. And as a result, and here's something we hear quoted often today, prepare to meet your God, O Israel. Therefore, thus I will do to you, O Israel, because I will do this to you. Prepare to meet your God, O Israel. So he continues his prophecy against Israel. I take up this word of lamentation. And uh, he will say in verse four, thus says the Lord to the house of Israel, seek me and live. You still have an opportunity to live. Seek me, though. He will say in verse six, you turn justice to wormwood and cast down righteousness to the earth. In verse 10, they hate him who reproves in the gate. Reproving in the gate, the gate would be the symbol for uh, political authority because the judges often sit in the gate. And the idea is those the judges are saying that somebody has done something wrong and they need reproof. Well, the people of Israel just hate him who does the, the judge in this case, who is reproving. And they abhor him who speaks the truth. Therefore, because you trample the, on the poor and you exact taxes of grain from them, he says, you afflict the righteous, you take a bribe, you turn aside the needy in the gate. And he says, seek good and not evil that you may live. Hate evil and love good and establish justice in the gate. In th this scene of power and authority in your city. But of course, they didn't do that and they did not return to the Lord. And, but they would say, again, appearing so pious and so very religious and devout, well, we want the day of the Lord to come. We want the day of the Lord. And he says, woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. Why would you do that? Why would you have the day of the Lord? Let me tell you something, as I paraphrase a little bit here. It is darkness, not light. Is not the day of the Lord darkness and not light and gloom with no brightness in it? You don't know what you're saying. When you want the day of the Lord, you hypocrites. And he says in verse 21, I hate, I despise your feasts, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though 
You offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings. I will not accept them. And the peace offerings of your fatted animals, I will not look upon them. Take away from me the noise of your songs. To the melody of your harps, I will not listen. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. And he goes on to say uh, that, that they had made all of these images of their difference, the star god, for instance, and Sikuth, your images that you made for yourselves. I'm going to send you into exile beyond Damascus. And that he did. And then as he continues, these people who are at ease and complacent and enjoying a luxurious life, paying no attention to the suffering of others, feeling secure in the mountains of Samaria, he says in, in the red portion here, woe to those who lie on beds of ivory and stretch themselves out on their couches and eat lambs from the flock and calves from the midst of the stall. And he says, I will deliver up the city and all that is in it. And so they're going to say, silence. We must not mention the name of the Lord. They're going to receive so much punishment that they're going to tell people, no, no, don't talk about the name of the Lord. It'll just ca cause more punishment to come, but it's going to come. The great house shall be struck down into fragments, the little house into bits. And here's an interesting statement. You have turned justice into poison and the fruit of righteousness into wormwood. You who rejoice in low the bar, you who say, have we not by our own strength captured carnium for ourselves? Well, they have been guilty of social sins. They've turned justice into poison, the fruit of righteousness into wormwood, which would be hypocrisy. But notice this statement, you who rejoice in low debar. What they meant by low debar, we can't be sure. <laughs> they, they, were, they were saying something about some place that they would rejoice in. But low debar in Hebrew means no place. No place. Again, a bit of sarcasm, I think, from Amos. And they were bragging about their own strength, like Pharaoh did about uh, creating the Nile River and, and Nebuchadnezzar about creating Babylon. You don't do that because God will not give his glory to another. So uh, the situation, woe for Israel. And they can certainly see that by this point, by the time we get to chapter 7, that Israel was in deep trouble with the Lord. But the question comes up then, what about Jacob? He's so small. Israel had 10 tribes out of the 12. And Judah, Jacob, the south, had only two. He's so small. But the Lord, notice this, relented concerning this. It shall not be, said the Lord. No, I'm, Jacob's not going to be destroyed. And the question's asked again after they have received so much punishment from the Lord in Israel. How can Jacob stand? He's so small. The Lord relented concerning this. This also shall not be, says the Lord. And then, as Amos was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, and a plumb line in his hand, the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And he said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, let's read the red, Behold, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never again pass by them. In other words, they're not going to be overlooked. I'm going to pay attention. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate. The sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. And then at this point, we have a false prophet. His name is Amaziah. He was a priest of Bethel, and he sent to Jeroboam, the king of Israel, saying, Amos, your prophet, has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel must go into exile from his land. And Amaziah said to Amos, O seer, go, flee away to the land of Judah and eat bread there, and prophesy there, but never again prophesy at Bethel. That's the capital of Israel. Never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary, and it is a temple of the kingdom. And then Amos answered and said to Amaziah, 
I was no prophet, nor a prophet's son. I was a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore figs. But the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go, prophesy to my people Israel. And indeed he did. And you'll see that prophecy uh, announced in verse 17, your wife shall be a prostitute in the city, your son and your daughter shall fall to the sword, and the land shall be divided up with a measuring line, you yourself shall die in an unclean land. Israel shall surely go into exile away from this land. And they did in 722, and they never returned. The 10 tribes were lost. So Amos goes on to say, the end has come upon my people Israel. I will never again pass by them. I will never overlook it and ignore their sins. The songs of the temple shall become wailings in that day, declares the Lord God. So many dead bodies. They're thrown everywhere. Silence. You who trample on the needy and bring the poor of the land to an end and deal deceitfully with false balances that we may buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals and sell the chaff of the wheat. No, surely I will never forget any of their deeds. And now I want to read the red, the, the, what's going to happen to uh, Israel in chapter 8, verse 9. On that day, declares the Lord God, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. I will turn your feasts into mourning and all your songs into lamentation. I will bring sackcloth on every waist and baldness on every head. I will make it like the morning for an only son and the end of it like a bitter day. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord God, when I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. They shall wander from sea to sea and from north to east. And they shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, but they shall not find it. In that day, the lovely virgins and the young men shall faint for thirst. Those who swear by the guilt of Samaria and say, as your God lives, O Dan, and as the way of Beersheba lives, they shall fall and never rise again. And the curses go on, and you see that in the red. I will not read all of that now, but the point is, as you see in the summary above, there is no escape from God's judgment. I will destroy Israel from the surface of the ground, except... Except, notice this, the very last line, I will not utterly destroy the house of Jacob, declares the Lord. In that day, verse 11, I will raise up the booth of David that's fallen and repair its breaches and raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations who are called by my name, declares the Lord who does this. Verse 14, I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel, and they shall rebuild the ruined cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink their wine. They shall make gardens and eat their fruit. I will plant them on their land, and they shall never again be uprooted out of the land that I have given them, says the Lord your God. Of course, that comes true when the people of the southern kingdom are allowed to return. And so uh, our study of the of prophecy in the general sense, beginning next week, we're going to look at some very specific prophecies, and our topic for next week will be the kingdom of Assyria. Thank you for being a part of our study today. May God richly bless all of you.